Welcome back to the Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander from Newcomers to this program. It's a place that we bring together the world's leading experts on all things health and wellness to help you optimize your life, your mind, your body, your movement, all the things. And uh, this conversation is exactly that. And uh, it goes beyond just your own life, but the life of the globe, earth, uh, agriculture. A really fantastic conversation with my dear friend, Anya Fernald. She is an author, a chef, a farmer, um, and a savvy businesswoman. She owns a really successful restaurant referred to as Bel Campo. That if you guys follow me on Instagram, you probably see me refer to. I go there quite often, and they have the highest quality uh, vegetables and meat and food that I have come across, certainly in Los Angeles, let alone just in my life in general. Uh, and the reason for that is they focus primarily on regenerative farming practices. Uh, by primarily, I mean exclusively. And uh, it's you can taste it in the food. And so Anya is a, I would say she's a brilliant woman. I was really impressed with uh, getting to sit with her in this conversation. Uh, for a good chunk of it, I was just in complete awe of um, all the amazing insight that she has on where our food comes from and uh, the how we can start to actually become uh, custodians or guardians of earth, of uh, the soil. So this conversation gets into exactly that. How can we create food for ourselves in such a way that actually restores the health and the vitality of the soil that we are uh, producing the food through? And so it's, a, it's an amazingly important conversation. I know you guys are really going to value it. So hope you guys love this conversation. And if you have any interest in learning how the heck to relieve that neck and back tension that you may have, I highly recommend jumping on to alignpodcast.com. If you are sitting down in a chair a lot, if you've got forward head posture, if you feel like your neck is kind of stiff and your back kind of feels sore, I break down some specific fundamentals that everybody ought to have in their daily life. Um, to alleviate some of those aches and pains and tensions that we all inevitably experience. So all that can be found at alignpodcast.com. From there, you can jump over to Align Method. Uh, it's all in the book, obviously, but we also have a lot of free content for you guys to dig into that. All right, here we go. Back to the podcast with the beautiful, the intelligent, the business and life savvy Anya Fernald. Thanks so much for making time to do this. Of course. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Um, I've been super excited. I kind of consider you to be like a modern day... Is heroin what you say with a girl? Or is that just a drug? Hero? Can you say oh, hero heroin, for yeah. heroin? Heroin, yeah. Yeah. Like I think that the food production in the United States and the world in general... Um, you know, and, and the impact on the, the land, on agriculture, mm-hmm. um, is such a major thing. And it's something that, like, presently, it's not necessarily, well, now it's coming to be, like, a, a common conversation. Um, but I think that's something that will very likely sneak up on us. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those, like, it's those underlying currents that all of a sudden it's like, oh, that was lingering the whole mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And then there's people like you that are that are doing the work for hopefully to prevent that or even make it make it better which goes into like regenerative farming as opposed to just sustainable or degenerative Mm -hmm. so thank you (laughs) yeah i was thinking about this yesterday because i drove down from um the bay area and i have a friend in her probably in her 70s now and she told me that when she was a little girl she had relatives in fresno she's in san francisco and her family would drive out to fresno a number of times a year and she remembered always that every time they drove there they had to stop two or three times because they couldn't see through the windshield because of all the insects hmm. and so now when you drive through the central valley you don't see one insect right hmm. but there's a lot more agriculture so that there's the there's the there's the problem right that we've everything that we're using in farming that way is killing off the whole ecosystem so i told my daughter my eight-year-old that story i said you know i have a friend who's you know, probably was driving this road 50 years ago, and back then they'd have to stop every hour to scrape off the windshields. We were talking about the why of it, and it's a complicated knot to unravel. 
you know, because she says, but they look so pretty. The fields look so pretty. And I say, yeah, but look at the color of the earth and think about the color of the earth on our farm and what that looks like. Yeah. You know, but it's hard to not look at the perfection and the beauty of it in the same way that you, you can't help but kind of marvel at how amazing, like, I was looking at the non-organic cauliflowers the other day. I was like, wow. They're like cauliflowers in a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, they're so beautiful, yeah. right? And they're so puffy and perfect and bland and, you know, flabby and mealy and everything. When you cut into them, it's like many things, right? It's not, uh, I can be deceiving, but it's interesting to kind of explain because on the superficiality of it, it's beautiful what we've created. You know, it's perfection. It's when you kind of dig into it that you start to discover what's what's going wrong. Yeah, there's the, in looking into... Uh, this conversation with you, one of the quotes that I that popped up was a John Muir quote. You probably heard it. Something along the lines of, of when you pull any string in the fabric of nature, you see it ripple out through everything. Mm-hmm. That's not what he said. Paraphrase. He said it in some more yeah. articulate way. Yeah. But I wonder with that, with like driving down the highway and all the bugs, like what is that? How did that change? And what are the implications of that from your perception? So I was talking to my daughter about this yesterday, you know, when the insects are gone and the reason the insects are gone is that we used, you know, pesticides on them um, to limit the, the amount of, of our, our crops that they compete for. Right. So we use insecticides, right, to 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 control them. And um, those insecticides operate where they disrupt the reproductive cycle of the insects themselves. So they hurt the insects, but then laterally that hurts the other species that use the insects as a food source. And then typically whatever like endocrine disruption, those insecticides are causing that cause the interrupt the fertility of those insects. Then they also have an endocrine issue that they cause for like the frogs that are in the ponds. And then right. when it rains, those pesticides run into the rivers and then those frogs are exposed to it. And then Lord, I mean, we certainly have a lot of fertility issues in modern day America yeah. We don't share a ton of DNA with those, but you know, there's, we're there's, 60% banana, right? So there's a lot of overlap <laughs> where I say, if it can totally jack the endocrine system and the fertility of one plant and one animal and everything, it's like, it's all connected, right? So there's to me, there's some real, real spillover, but you know, they, the removal of insects from agriculture, um, it, 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 it's just the, it's just one piece of the way that we've tried to extract this certain fertile, highly productive component of things and mechanize it and make it work in a formulaic way that we can control. We control the inputs and the outputs. You know, farming has always been kind of like a, a of a you know, something that's volatile, that's in concert with nature. That's yeah. how it evolved. And in the past 50 years, we've taken that that collaboration with nature out. We've mastered it, right? And it's it's in in doing that um, we've sort of willfully disregarded and I think for you and for your you know folks that are listening it's kind of thinking about it a lot about the way we deal with the body you know I think about it like in even some of the concerns about how we say treat cancer today where we treat cancer by just like nuking one component of your body to the vast detriment of the resilience of the rest of your body so that's a way it works it achieves an outcome it works in certain cases but I think looking at things holistically, some people prefer a more holistic approach, right? Mm. Um, or in anything. And like in, if you say, even with the use of, say, an antibiotic, um, you might want to look at a system and say, well, maybe a minor infection, you might want to just ride that out um, and not expose your body to the detrimental effects of the antibiotic to achieve that faster turnaround so you can get back to work the next day, right? There's also sort of a, I'm not saying mer- like advocating that people ignore infections, but there's an overuse. I know when I was a teenager, I was, you know, I had zits and I go to the doctor and they're like amoxicillin every day. And I started Whoa. taking amoxicillin and I started throwing up every day at like 10 a.m. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm just going to lay off this, right? Because it really upset my system, but that was just the thing. It's like, you have a couple pimples. Awesome. Take this. You know, your pimples will go away. And it's, it's terrifying because you're going up against the medical orthodoxy. It's like the church of, of, of medicine. Mm-hmm. And you're just this little girl or random whoever. Yeah. It's like, Oh, what do I, I'm just a carpenter. Yeah. You, you don't know. know. And you, it's like, intuitively it feels like this, Yeah, but you are this whole organization and you have the books and the, the badges and the suit and, so to be able to trust your intuition in that system, it's like, it makes it more challenging. Absolutely. And I, you know, there's a lot of analogies in a lot of ways we handle things, especially in the U.S. around how we treat our bodies, how we treat our environment that are really si- similar kind of systemic and uh, approaches and thinking that don't pay attention to a holistic approach, right? Mm. That look at zeroing in on one issue and then nuking that issue. 
and saying, well, whatever, everything around is destroyed, but we solved that one issue, right? Yep. Like we made like the cauliflower is now we can charge, you know, whatever, 80 cents a pound for it. We solved that one issue. It's like, yeah, but all the birds are dead. Okay. But that's what, that wasn't the problem we were solving, guys. That's the answer, yeah. right? We were solving this one issue. And if we're unable to take a step back and look at the broader context of the broader costs. You yeah. know, and in my industry, at, at livestock, you know, m- raising meat, it's even more pronounced because in that space you have, you know, we're using the identical antibiotics that we use to treat infections in humans. So the, I- the implications for human health are so immediate and so massive but we still treat them with disregard. So in chicken production, we can increase the rate of chicken gaining weight by one and a half times by giving them amoxicillin or tetracycline. Those are the most commonly prescribed antibiotics in America, right? Mm. And they're used in enormously important ways across the U.S., right, all the time in humans. But we're, we're creating, we're gestating actively extreme resistance to them. Yep. And we're also potentially creating like breeding grounds for superbugs in these factory farms. We talk about the next coronavirus, right? That's going to yeah, most likely yeah. come from a factory farm where you've got a bunch of animals in close contam- contamination and a lot of disease and a lot of uh, the antibiotics that we have at hand, right? That they can become resistant to. So we choose to use these to overprescribe these antibiotics in our factory farms. We've documented that people who live within a couple miles get so much tetracycline in the air that they breathe. It's airborne. Right, that's how much tetracycline they're using in these farms. That they develop resistance to those antibiotics, mm. and they have to be using ciprofloxacin or something even heavier to when they get sick. Yeah. So we we've you know we were so willfully focused on this one thing, which is make the cheap meat, make the animals grow fast, that we disregard the longer term implications that this massive like silver bullet of medicine that we have in antibiotics is going to be effectively denatured, you know, and, and yeah. rendered useless. Yeah, it feels like you can you it's like squishing around a tube of toothpaste you can like you can move the you can squeeze the one end but mm-hmm. it just puts that exact quantity over to the other side well i think about it you know in talking to people about the cost of good food uh and why does it cost more why does it cost more to farm without chemicals that doesn't make any sense yep. right chemicals should be expensive why does it cost more to farm holistically and to do lots of little patches of vegetables and have some animals? That looks like the sort of folksy old way of doing things. It should be it should be far cheaper, right? And the the efficiencies and that that solving for costs. I mean, that's the thing we should be in some ways enormously proud of in the U.S. Like we've done an amazing job. But the American dream was come to the U.S. and you'd have all the food and all the meat that you wanted, right? So we've solved for that. We've created this really really cheap food, but at a huge human cost. Mm. And I I think about when you're you know talking to 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 people about food and this in, the the first thing that comes up is like well it's so damn expensive you know buying the I know what I should be eating but it's so expensive and I think you do need to look at that tube of toothpaste and say well that's going to be money I'm spending on my health yeah later on that's going to be you know a really outsized health expenses later on in my life and it's and another thing too I think you know I'm I'm a fan of supplementation and I supplement and I think it's really needed in today's world because of how impoverished our food stuff is. But that's another way of looking at it. It's like, yeah, you might end up spending, you know, far more on vitamins that you're going to need to supplement to get your base level health up if you're going to be eating that nutritionally impoverished food. Yeah. I wonder from your perception, how did we become convinced that having ruminants and, you know, cattle and grazing animals on the land how did that become a problem as opposed to a solution for things like desertification? Things I don't really understand. I've watched a couple mm-hmm. Netflix things and some TED Talks and such. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there were in, in, 15, in the 1500s, there was something like 30 million buffalo. And in 2017, mm-hmm. there was, I think, uh, what was it? Like 500,000, I believe. Mm-hmm. You know, so like in the past we had all of these animals and they were out there and they were pooping and they were peeing and they're stomping at ground yeah. and they're, you know, they're creating this, this, this little ecosystem. And now somehow they became like a, like a culprit or an issue mm-hmm. for, uh, carbon emissions and methane gas and all that stuff. How did that tail get, get woven? It has to do with feeding a maladaptive diet, right? So, um, the the issue let's talk specifically i mean animals and humans and ruminants and monogastrics like pigs and chickens have lived in concert right for 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 millennia right and they they wouldn't be working together if they were extractive right yeah. 
in the old fashioned, and we got some marrow bones and some. We got marrow bones oh coming up. Gosh. How exciting! Okay, so for people something. listening, we are uh, we're here at Bel Campo in Santa Monica, and uh, this is so exciting. How great! Thank you. So yeah. if you hear any bells or plates clanking or anything like that in the background, this is the real thing. We're here at the restaurant. And we just got some food. It's thank fantastic. You. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you so Miguel. Much. I appreciate oh, it. How so lovely. Good. What a great experience. Oh, I'm so grateful for life. All these marrow bones. Amazing. Wow. And I ha- uh, <laughs> so we just started killing our chickens again this year. We, we slaughter the chickens um, seasonally. Yeah. And um, because where our farm is, we raise them, you know, all outdoors. But in the cold weather, they suffer a lot more from predation. Yeah. So we raise them only in the periods where they're less likely to get predated. Mm. So I can't stop myself with chicken liver. Chicken liver no, is like it's okay. A, eat, the chicken, li- eat, eat the chicken liver. Um, so <laughs> well, we really have a lot of the awful, this delicious chicken liver. And you can really taste how clean the animals are in the liver without that kind of like bitter ammoniac finish that you get from stressed animals in confinement. Interesting. There's a cleaner, like it should taste like sort of earthy and like hummus in the sense of earthy hummus, not like the chickpea stuff. Yeah. Right? That kind of like the way that like compost smells in a good way. Mm. That's the taste you get from the finish of liver. But yeah, on, on, so thinking about the role, you know, one beautiful metaphor that I love, you know, the, the, the piggy bank, right? The piggy bank, like you put your coins in every day. Yep. I always thought that was something that people like to have because it's a cute animal and you give them to kids. What I learned is that the piggy bank has been around for centuries and it's a, it's a metaphor because the pig was some, an animal you kept in your courtyard. You would put some scraps into it. Every day you'd scrape whatever your your corn husks and your leftover food and things that were going to go bad or gone bad. And then after a, a, a couple of years, you cracked it open and you had far more wealth than you had put in. Hmm. So it's a beautiful kind of metaphor, right? So all those pennies ended up being a hundred bucks after a couple of years. And that's the way, that was the function of the pig in the courtyard in the old fashioned kind of farmstead. Whoa. So that's just one example of like, in there's a monogastric. So pigs are like humans have one single digestive tract. So they're very good at eating high nutrition density food. A pig could eat this chicken liver and these marrow bones and be really happy and healthy. Yeah. A cow couldn't, right? But there was a, that's a, just one example of a way that, you know, an animal and, and humans have functioned. There was a, it was a garbage dump, right? That basically transformed waste food in a highly efficient way into nutritious protein. Hmm. Amazing, right? It's pretty cool. And the same, you know, if I think about, we're talking about the the role of the, you know, the ruminant. Think about the way that that people lived on small plots of land for generation after generation in in antiquity, right? You weren't going to be practicing an extractive style of agriculture if you knew that your great 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 grandchildren were going to be in that same stone house with that same plot of land, right? Right. You had a natural curator's mentality because. Yeah, that was it, right? There wasn't this massive flux of people going places. People only left when really things hit the fan, right? And mm. then you'd migrate or wars happened or whatever, but there wasn't this sort of like strong economic migration. It wasn't easy to move around like it is now in many ways. So there, they, the idea that this has always been part of history, these are extractive animals, it just doesn't align with how you know traditional homesteading and farmsteading worked, right? That these people lived in community with, with the land and were curators and custodians of the land. Now, the way that the ruminants in particular, so the ruminants are not monogastrics. They've got lots of different stomachs. They have five stomachs. So they've evolved to eat food that would make you or I very sick. And that is a very low nutrient density food. Um, Grasses, right? Primarily high fiber, low in calories. And they'll take this very poor roughage and turn it into high quality protein. And they do that with these five stomachs that that digest um, sequentially the, wow. the grass and transform it into high quality nutrition. So as, again, it's about like the same way the pig can take the scraps from the, from the buckets in the house and turn it into high quality protein. This was a way to take grass, right? That grew like at God's grace in, in the fields and turn that into high quality, high quality protein. Is it like stomach, intestines, stomach, intestines, or did it's actually know? stomach links to stomach. Um, stomach and then stomach, some, stomach. Of, some of the stomachs are more like a big intestine. Wow. And that's, I mean, it's beautiful too, you know, the way you coagulate. I started out my career as a, as a cheesemaker and the way you actually coagulate cheese is with an, an enzyme that's found in the in the fifth stomach of an unweaned cow. That was actually the way that they break down. There's a beautiful connection with like so many of our products in, in human history and, and the way that animals' digestion works, right? Huh. 
Um, but you know, the way that, that animals were, you know, used in, in the ecosystems is how the ecosystems themselves were built, right? You get an animal to eat a delicious seed, right? That's formed, passes through the digestive tract, drops in the form of manure onto the earth, right? So you have it being dropped in a pile of fertilizer in a natural environment that's adapted for, right? These are the types of systems that we evolved, right? And in, in the case of where our farming became extractive, it's when we started to concentrate the farming. So putting lots of animals in very dense conditions without enough nature around them to absorb their effluence and to naturally feed them. And then also we began feeding our ruminants, the five stomachs, very maladaptive calorie intense food of grain. And that most recent development only really happened, kicked off in the U.S. And it was it's kind of a specialty thing in certain areas for like, you know, the evolution of like the Kobe beef and things where they fed this very, you know, inflammatory high calorie diet to cows to get this super fatty, precious meat. Yep. So it existed in little pockets. It's kind of a funky thing, but we really figured out how to do it at scale in the U.S. And it was always supported in the U.S. by our commodified you know, subsidy system. So the fact that we make it very cheap to grow and sell corn in the U.S. Yeah. As you're as you're speaking, I'm realizing that you're kind of more vegan than most vegans. I right. <laughs> I'm like she's vegan AF. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Down to the subtle details, like you're like you really are. You're a custodian and guardian. Use your own language of animals. It's very fascinating. If you give, if you if you really start to talk to people. And go deeper into, I mean, some people are, you know, if you go deeper into, you're like, okay, there's not really a lot there. But um, when you go deeper into this industry of, of agriculture, especially mm -hmm. regenerative, um, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you are doing more to protect animals because you're paying attention in a sense. Yeah, I feel that my passion for animal agriculture comes from a love of animals. I mean... It's really where it's rooted in. Yeah. And I feel like my mission is to improve the life of animals by improving people's attention to meat quality. I should eat some of you this. You should. The you, liver. You, you'd probably be offended if so I just good. sat here and just drank bone I'm broth. kind of offended like a little punk. this long. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I apologize. This is lovely. So what is this that I'm eating right now? That's marrow. Uh, so it's the center of the femur. So the you know, the thigh bone of the, of the beef. Yeah. And it's, um, a lot of, it's primarily fat and collagen, hmm. really high collagen. The thing that's interesting, again, more of like the kind of aberrations or mutations of modern industrial farming and just food consumption is we pick out certain parts of the animal that are socially okay to ingest, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I want a filet mignon, mm -hmm. but man, if I could have filet mignon every night, like I'd really be living the good life. Mm -hmm. You know, so then when you go to a grocery store and you see all these filet mignons and New York strips or whatever, mm -hmm. each one of those was a whole animal to create that. Mm -hmm. You know, so by eating nose to tail the way that, you know, we, we have forever and all critters in nature that, that are omnivorous mm -hmm. do, um, you're getting all these vital nutrients uh, and you're actually, uh, you're conserving the animal. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't even think we know enough about why these foods are so vital. I mean, all the white blood cells of the animal, which are crucial to all of our um, immune response, are all formed in the marrow. Wow. And I don't really believe, like, eat brain to get smarter. There isn't a direct correlation between putting it in your body and being connected to that. But there is a suggestion, given that enormously sophisticated role that it plays in the animal, that there's, you know, micronutrient profile um, and just a level of, you know, the funny thing too, Aaron, is my, my children both will eat, like, uh, two plates like this. Of marrow this bones, is kids are insanely delicious. Yeah, kids are really instinctual about this about marrow too. I know many people who tell me like, "Oh my God, my child traced marrow bones and just freaked out." My, it, it, they, they, it's like something really deep. There's a deep nutrition component to eating this type of food. And critters in nature as well, when they do, you know, wolves or lions or what you know what have you if they're getting a zebra or whatever the heck it is their, their prey is they'll go for the organs mm -hmm. yep you know so they're not gonna 
go grab a, a butt or a, mm-hmm. you know whatever wherever the the the, the fillet comes from where is the fillet in humans i, I heard is the leosoas was the fillet is that wrong Ooh, i don't even know what that is Sorry. i know that the fillet is only it's a, it's actually like the thrusting muscle for sex in in a beef yeah right and okay so yeah it's, the it's a, adjacent to the loin yeah. So it's not the reason that it's so tender is not used very often, yeah. especially not in confinement animals. Interesting. Um, so, oh, and then, the, but mm-hmm. a natural animal that would be used, it wouldn't be as, as yeah, it's delicious. Mating. Yeah, I mean, in general, a nat. Well, so our animals do mate naturally, but you're not gonna. They're not jumping around. That our fillets are still incredibly tender. Yeah. But like in humans, you know, think about it in in, in your world. The more you exercise a muscle, the firmer it is. Yeah. Right. And the same th- and the less fat it has in it. And the less fat it has surrounding it. And the so, fat's the good stuff. So, well, it, it can be. You know, it depends on how healthy it is, too. But right. a grass-fed and finished animal is going to have typically about half the fat of a corn-finished animal. Mm. Be- and it's a mix of, it, it, when it's eating corn, it's inflamed, right? It's actually a, a diet that's pretty bad for it. So it'll actually have a pretty strong inflammatory response. It'll tend to gain weight more. And then it's also very high calorie. And those animals are also standing still. You know, there's always, like, the extreme case that... that makes everything false right but that's so there are some feedlot operations where they keep them outside and then they go to get grain but most of them are on cement or bare earth it's about 15 animals in a pen and then those pens have a bucket of food in them so there's animals are just not getting around um and they're not moving they're typically getting antibiotics Mm. um to suppress their immune response which is like their bodies are prone to get very sick yeah. Um, from all the inflammation. So they're eating a super bad diet and they're not moving around much. Yeah. And they have a lot of social anxiety to the degrees that cows have that because they don't get interaction. They don't have a mate. They don't have their kids. They don't like, they're not part of a group. I mean, animals, it's beautiful. On our farm, the way they, you know, the cows move, I mean, cows, okay, it's a highly domesticated species, but you'll actually see when they move, it's like a teardrop shape. And then the babies are in the middle and the big mamas are on the outside. Like, they behave like a wild animal. They protect their young. They're, you know, they're instinctual animals that are herd animals. And they'll behave in a way that suggests a, a strong, you know, social organization. So if you put them in a feedlot context in that box, they're going to be stressed out and bummed out. And they're also eating crummy food, you know. So, right. And then that's like the, the corn is what they're supposed to eat. But it's legal and common in the U.S. to feed cows um, uh, sawdust as a nutritional supplement for fiber. Shavings of plastic are also legal. Whoa. It's also, if you Google cow and Skittle, you'll see there was an expose a while ago about how common it is to feed um, damaged candy to cows in the packages. Wow. So they're eating really bad food. Whoa. So if you look at, you know, why why are these animals, I, I think about it as, okay, if if you were to look at, you know, imagine a dog peeing on a yard, you'd say, whatever, it's a dog peeing on a yard. If you saw 50 dogs peeing into one spot on a yard, be like, mm, that, that yard's going to die, right? right? And that's what happens when you have a bunch of animals together with all their effluents. Like a little bit's fine. It's actually good for the earth. If you have a bunch of it concentrated in one place, it's not going to be good. It's going to have too much nitrogen to sustain life, right? And it'll actually kill everything around it. So when you have confinement, it creates that concentration of everything, right? They're fed concentrated food. They're kept in a concentrated environment and they have concentrated effluents. And those concentrated effluents behave in a super different way than like a little bit of those effluents would around a pasture spread out with animals moving around. So in our operation, we'll have animals packed densely. They'll be in their natural herd moving through the alfalfa or the grass or wherever they are, depending on the stage of their life, they get different nutrition, different access to pastures. But they're distinctly moving through, right? So they're, we're actually moving them on micro plots of pasture to different areas to mimic a natural grazing pasture. And many of our pastures that are more brittle, right? So those mean that they're effectively um, land that doesn't have the same kind of fertility, right? So some land has naturally has a lot of water and a lot of fertility to it. So our more brittle land is like at the base of the mountainsides. And that might not see an animal for more than two days of the year. So there's certain pastures that because of the nature of that pasture will really like pass the animals through as if they're just kind of walking across slowly for a day or two, depending on the natural fertility. Then we do have some irrigated pasture that we don't till, right? We don't break the seed, the root structure by, by night, by disking it or tilling it, which releases carbon. So we keep that all intact, but it does get water that can sustain animals for a week, right? So it just depends, but that's a different type of kind of attention to farming than what we have in America now, right? You're paying attention to the landscape. You're looking at the long-term fertility of a pasture, thinking about the impact of those animals. Compare that to effectively like dumping the corn into into the corral, right? Where these animals are kept and they get their pounds per 
day ration, right? Yeah. So it's a different, that the reasons why it's more expensive and more complex, it's like the list goes on and on. So what's the debate of the cow farts being such a big issue in the world? I want to take a quick moment to discuss a very valuable mineral that is in large part vacant in our soil, which is exactly what we're talking about in this conversation with Anya. So how fantastic that this works out this way. We're going to talk about magnesium. So magnesium is a mineral that uh, sometimes referred to as a master mineral. It is a part of over 300 critical reactions in your body, including detoxification, fat metabolism, energy production, and uh, also digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. One of the issues with this, it has been deficient in our soil since the 1950s. And uh, that explains why about 80% of the population may be deficient in this stuff. Uh, many magnesium supplements that we get uh, will only have some of the forms of magnesium. Um, I have teamed up with Bio Optimizers, who have been friends of the podcast for a while now. And uh, they have a new supplement out that I've been really digging. I've been taking it before bed. In fact, I'm about to take it. And it contains all seven forms of magnesium that are helpful for the function of your bod. Uh, so really great stuff. Has a great taste. I actually kind of open up the pills and taste them just because I'm a weirdo. I like to taste what the heck's going on. And uh, it's excellent stuff. You can get yourself a discount on it as well. You get 10% discount off to try it. Uh, if you don't love it, you can uh, get a full money back guarantee. So nothing to risk. Uh, go to magbreakthrough.com. Magbreakthrough is spelled M-A-G-B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H.com forward slash align podcast. You know how to spell align podcast for 10% off of your purchase. Like I said, this is excellent stuff. I have been enjoying it. And uh, it also has, what do you got here? They got some, some monoatomic magnesium, something interesting, which helps make all other forms more bioavailable. It's good stuff. They're like putting technology and life force and stuff into it. So I dig it. It's got all the things that you need. Magnesium, hands down, will be the only supplements that I would actually purchase. So highly recommend getting yourself, getting your hands on magnesium, especially if you're looking for muscle recovery, if you're looking to sleep better, any of that stuff. So grab a bottle of this stuff. If you don't like it, all your money back. No worries. Magbreakthrough.com forward slash Align Podcast. That's M-A-G breakthrough.com forward slash online podcast. Okay, back to the program with Anya. So methane <laughs> emissions, the cow farts. Yeah, the, the methane's emissions are, are real. And there is good data that suggests that like everything, when you give a cow a diet that makes it sick to its stomach, it has more cow farts, right? Mm. So that there is a higher emission of um, methane from animals that are that are um, in confinement and fed a maladaptive diet. Now, what we have shown is that, you know, all of our cows are going to produce methane. But if you look at the, and there's a great study out of white oak pastures, which is a very analogous to our operation in terms of regenerative practices, where there's a, a net negative carbon impact um, for every cow, independent of methane. So counting against the methane. So I'm not going to say our farms don't produce methane. I know they do produce less methane than industrial operations where they're fed food. Well, is methane even sick. a bad thing if it's in the circle of life? Well, the is problem is it's not dropping into the soil where it can get integrated. It's going up, right? Okay. So it doesn't have a it doesn't it doesn't have a way to interact with the soil. Our soil can't sequester the methane, right? But indirectly, if we look at the amount of carbon that our soil sequesters, right, and on our ranch with our animals. Between 2013 and 2019, we've done a longitudinal study of actual density of carbon in the soil, and we've shown significant measured third-party increases in carbon in the soil in the farms that we have been ranching. Hmm. So the only thing I can say is, yeah, it, they do produce methane. I mean, bison in the wild produce methane. Lots of animals produce methane. Yep. In our operation, the carbon sequestered in the soil does offset the amount of methane that they naturally produce. And the methane they produce naturally is somewhat less than it would be were they on a corn diet. And what is the process exactly of, of sequestering carbon within the soil? Like how does that function on a regenerative farm? Yeah, so cool. And what does regenerative farm mean? Because that's a word that I like. I throw around because mm -hmm. it sounds nice and I feel like empowered and like 
you know, a real new age <laughs> taking <laughs> yeah. care of the planet. But I'm like, I actually really know yeah. what that means. <laughs> so regenerative <laughs> means that the agriculture actively contributes to the health of the soil. Okay. So I think about it as like, if you were to say, um, hey, Anya, I've got this really busy month ahead and I'm just going to, I'm not going to sleep. I'm just going to drink coffee all day, every day and just power through. Yeah. And then you're going to say, how do you think I'm going to turn out at the end of the month? As opposed to, okay, I've got this really big month ahead. I'm going to be trying to hit my goals of sleeping 10 hours a night, keeping up my workouts and getting everything done in as efficient a way as possible. I think I'm not going to put out as much, but I, I think I'm, I'm, it's probably going to be a better choice for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I think of the kind of the regenerative approach is the guy who's like, you know what? I'm going to get my sleep and try not to, um, to, to, to fall apart entirely. Because effectively, the way that we're farming now is extractive. So we're not looking towards what happens at the end of that month. Yep. Does that make sense? So it's like when I'm farming regeneratively, I'm making sure that in 10 years, the land is in better quality than it was when I started. We're treating the land like an oil, oil well. Extractive versus um, you know, a building. Just get it out and then, then, then move on. Exactly. Until eventually there's nowhere to move on. And it's interesting you build up, you know, bring in oil because the, it's actually the way that we kind of refertilize soil that we've taken the natural health out of is we, we dump, in, you know, petroleum-based fertilizers on it. Right. right. So it's actually truly extractive because, I mean, it all comes from the earth. Right. So petroleum actually contains vast reserves of fertility. Right. It's power. Right. It's gas. It's light. It's energy. And you can extract, you know, types of fertilizer from that. And that's what's used to to re-enliven soil that's been decimated by its natural juices. So, so just think about the medicine angle of it. You know, you're you're really savvy. on this. You could probably think of a great analogy for it, but it's like as if you strip your body of all the natural energy and you start you know, taking cocaine, right? right? And then there's a there's a way you can still prop yourself up, right? You can do it, but you're not gonna you're not gonna feel great after five years, yeah. right? And you're probably gonna die younger, and you you're probably more likely to get cancer, right? So all these things, it's like in any natural system. You can't have this this mentality of just like, go to the wall, go to the wall, take it all out and just pump in some chemicals to keep things looking like they're working, right? At the end of the day, you're going to have to, you know, ditch that body for another body, right? There's a, there's no way that you that it can sustain that. It's how the Nazis did so well for a while, but then eventually they fell. Right. They were all hopped up on yeah, amphetamines. Amphetamines, yeah. yeah. I mean, these this idea, and per we all... Pervitin. We know these Perfect people, though, the in all of our lives. Like, we all have people like that, right? Yeah. Who are just like, wow, how do they do it all? It's all amazing. And then it's like crash and burn. You actually can't sustain it. Can't sustain so it. regenerative is a way of like, I think of it as like analogous to just thoughtful self-care. You know, it's like paying it forward, getting your sleep in, making sure you drink enough water and exercise and, you know, and, and see your loved ones. It's like about a way of paying it forward in the care of things so that at the end of the month, even though you've put out a lot of work and you've dealt with a lot of stuff and you've made a lot of things happen, you still are A plus feeling great and ready to tackle the next month. Yeah. So regenerative farming is that same approach, but around agriculture. So just quite, you know, literally and tactically what that means in the case of corn and beef. In a regenerative system, you've got rain falls down, there's a pasture, and that grass grows, cow eats it, cow gets fat, slaughter cow, make a steak. In a confinement corn system, you're raising, you're tilling the ground with a tractor, right? Gas goes into that. Planting a bunch of seeds with a tractor, gas. Putting fertilizer on that's based on petroleum and distributing that fertilizer with gas. Watering it with manual irrigation, right? So water is being pumped out of a well or taken out of a ditch, pumped onto fields multiple times, right? And then the corn grows, the sun, and the water. And then you've got another tractor coming in with gas, going around tilling it and then drying it and then, you know, barreling it up and bushelling it. And then it gets trucked somewhere where the cows are. Yep. But somehow that, so that ladder system, you think about carbon. Well, of course, there's like 20 touch points where a machine is used to process something. Yeah. And then it has to be taken to the cow. Cow's not going to walk out to the cornfield and cut that stuff down, right? It, it, so it's very different from a grass system. So if you think about why is it more regenerative, that's the number one thing, right? This All the human intervention needed to grow, cultivate, fertilize, feed, till, harvest that one product. Mm. The other thing that's more kind of subtle is actually in the earth what's happening. Regenerative ag with that grass. So the cows are coming along and eating the tops off the grass, right? We let the grass go to about 12 to 14 inches. It gets the mass, the very high bricks of natural sugar content. Then they come in when it's at the peak sugar content. They eat it and they get a little boost and they get a little bit of fat in their system, right? What's happening under the ground? 
those root systems that are powering that final growth and that final little push of sweetness in the grass, those root systems go 30 feet deep. Wow. So the reason why they're able to survive with natural irrigation and natural rainfall, right? I mean, how amazing it every year, right? You think about those dry hills that we have in California, and then it rains and boom, it's all green. It's not like those were seeds that sprouted, right? Yeah. Those plants come back to life, right? How do those plants come back to life? They've got root systems that go 30, 40 feet deep mm. on those hillsides in California, Right? That's how it works. And so they come back to life because those root systems have been holding on down there where there's still a little bit of water. They get wet again. They push back up. They come out. They fertilize. They germinate. They drop the seeds. The birds eat them. All that stuff. Right? So that's the cycle there. So that, that, that's actually a carbon sequestering environment. So the, actually, literally, the way it happens is that carbon is taken in by the plants and, and, and pushed into the soil through nodes on the roots. So the longer and more intricate the root system is in a plant, the more carbon it will push into the soil. Wow. That whole process there, that's the cycle of carbon and on Earth, right? Which and is that's the opposite of monocropping, where you're tilling the soil and taking all that up and focusing on when annuals and perennials. When we take the till out and we cut the root system, we take away the plant's superpower to put the carbon back in. So for, you know, we, we have talked a lot in, the, in, in our culture about rainforest. Like, we all freak out about the rainforest getting cut down. And not to trivialize that, but, like, the rainforest in our backyard was the prairie in America, Right. Huh. We we tilled the prairie, wow. and we got some of the you know the, the the wheat harvests from the 1930s when the first tilling of the Great American Prairie happened. They still today have not exceeded those tonnages, even with all the GMOs and pesticides and chemicals of the world. They were some of the highest wheat harvests per acre in human history, and that was in the prairies and the big that. And after two or three years, those cratered, and that's now that then the, the Dust Bowl happened. So when we have these natural systems, they build up an immense fertility, even when the environment itself is not particularly rich, right? So there's a, but it's a pretty thin environment there right on top of these. So these marginal lands, right? These grasslands, they aren't abundant. You've heard this probably about the rainforest too. When you cut down the rainforest, it all slides away, right? Because these are, these are complex environments that are built off of a mix of what's above the soil, but primarily below the soil, really intricate root systems that sustain these plants year on year and sequester carbon. Mm. When you cut the tops off and till them, you ruin that. And effectively, it's not that rich ecosystem that can sustain more growth. So when we are farming in brittle lands in particular, so what, to be clear too, this type of farming that I'm talking about, it's really not for, it's it, the, with grassland farming, but it's not something I would say, oh, do that in the Central Valley where you've got rich agricultural fertile land naturally. This is for land that's more marginal. But the, the mix of ruminants and perennial grasses can take this marginal land and turn it into a carbon positive player in the environment. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. And that's like the, I wish we talked more about that, you know, in, in terms of what we can do as Americans to support a better environment, right, in carbon. It's it, it, supporting a natural use of ruminants and a natural ecosystem of prairies. That's a huge piece of the puzzle. Why? I guess it's because there's subsidies going towards big businesses or government or, or they're already bought into a system where we're producing lots of corn and the train's already moving in that direction. It would be too inconvenient for them to, to shift or what? It's more costly to produce on grass. Yeah. And it has to do with the subsidies for sure, right? The subsidies make, you know, that system I described with all the different steps and the different tractors that's still a cheaper way to raise a cow, which is crazy. Because think about it, all the gas and the labor and the shipping that goes into that piece of meat right. compared to my meat where it's an animal in one place eating some grass and then going 20 minutes away to our slaughterhouse, right? That shouldn't cost more. Hmm. That's, that's crazy, right? But it does cost a lot more. So the way we produce, along with many other awesome regenerative farms and ranches in the U.S., it's um, typically like four or five times the cost to produce of what a corn-fed finished animal does. Now, Part of that's because our animals have to live longer on a regenerative farm to get to a weight gain that's suitable for harvest. Right. Because if you're walking a lot and eating a really healthy diet that's super good for you, your weight gain is, no surprise, way slower than if you're not moving around and eating a diet that's bad for you. Yeah. So our animals take um, an, a, basically an additional year to come to finish. So the other argument... Well, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't really have any arguments, but but a question that you've been asked lots of times, I would imagine, is is that scalable and can that work for 350 million people? Mm. Yeah. So there's a couple, you know, there's a couple of thoughts I have around that. 
And it's not scalable for how we eat meat now in America. Hmm. Okay. And we don't all have to be eating like the marrow bones for it to work. But a crazy fact is almost half of the meat that we produce in America is thrown away. That's wild. So food waste is a huge issue in the U.S., as you know, right? Yeah. But so you think about it, animals are like produced in a way that's terrible for the environment. The animals suffer. It's basically torture. They die in pain. And then we throw them away. It's like the most abyss. And they taste terrible along the way, right? Crazy. So, you know, you, I get a little inkling of it around coronavirus because you've noticed like how you've been reading the stories about how much meat we're overproducing now. But yeah, still nobody's like with. going hungry, right? Right. A lot of it's because a lot of it went into food service, right? Which is now shut down effectively, which is a really bad actor in the food waste area. Hmm. Okay, so think about all the endless buffets, right? That Why kind is of, that a bad actor? Without well, food? I mean, it's just a food waste. It's a high. It's a bad actor on the food waste area. Okay, so cafeterias and food service providers, oh. large scale food providers, like they have to cook enough food for a hypothetical consumption. So they tend to be people who are looking to buy cheaper meat with the intention that not all is going to be eaten. Right. So, if you look at like can regenerative farming feed America? Hell no! With half of the meat being thrown away, hmm. right? Um, hell no with everybody just wanting to only eat steaks. Okay. Right. So there are some issues around that as a, as a single, as a single question and a single answer for me. I think you have to say, is there room to improve how we eat animals to better optimize for human health and for environmental health? Hell yeah. Right. We could make things a lot better by eating more of the animal and cooking more of the animal and also not throwing it away. Right. Which means just being more conscious about it. But it's it's extremely easy to to become casual about things and not be conscious about costs when they're free, right? When you have chicken that's ninety nine cents a pound, like it's like whatever. Okay, that went bad. I'm just gonna ditch it. Yep. Okay, I get hell because my chickens are very expensive, right? They're like six ninety nine a pound, five ninety nine a pound, depending on which breed you. But I'd say, well, that's you know, chicken. Our chickens take take five times as long to raise as a Tyson chicken, and it's precious. It's it's a very expensive animal to raise. Right, we don't make a ton of money off of that. We barely make any money off of that chicken, and it's not that we're operating inefficiently. We produce, you know, close to fifty thousand of them a year. Right, so it's not a tiny operation um, that's operating subscale or something. These animals have real costs to produce them, and I also think it's fair to say, well, why don't we command a price that commands you as a consumer to be attentive and be like, oh, cool, what could I do with the bones? Yeah. After I eat it, you know. So there's a, I think there's a shift in uh, mentality that has to happen around the value of meat for us to conceive of a regenerative future. Hmm. And I, you know, I I don't, um, I don't mean to kind of like, I'm not in the business of, of, of casting aspersions on the, on the alternative meat world or the cricket meats or the different things. But broadly, you know, I think we're taking a very flawed system and saying, you know what, this sucks. So meat sucks. And so let's just pivot and work towards this totally crazy, hyper-processed, genetically modified-based stuff. And I want to raise my hand in the corner and be like, hey, guys, I think we need to take another look at this and say, does this as a category not make sense? Does this just not work for us in the modern world? Or have we driven it to an extreme where it's actually no longer logical and deeply flawed? And so let's fix it first before we decide to just ditch it. Yep. You know, and that's, I, I don't, I, I'm kind of like bummed out that our generation is not more critical as like in terms of critical thinking about this, because I think that as critical thinkers, we should be saying, wow, you know what? We kind of, we kind of went a little too far on this um, yep. cheap meat thing. Let's dial it back a little bit, get things that are, you know, and let's, let's put a price against it that makes people value it and reevaluate it. Like there's just so much good to be had in this, in this industry. And so I think there's just room for people to give a little bit more of their mental bandwidth and look at the complexity of the problem and say, is meat bad or is the system that we're raising it in right now bad? How hopeful are you for the future of agriculture wow. in, in the Western world? Hmm. Scale of one to ten. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's... Um, I think a lot's riding on conscious consumerism right now. You know, I, I'm happy that you 
are using the word regenerative. You know, that's great. That's the word that we should be using. Even if I don't know what it is. Even if you don't know what it means. Just just get it out there. Just put it on a t-shirt. Hashtag regenerative farming. Get it going. (laughs) Just hashtag everything. Virtue signal that shit. It's time. The world's ready. They love it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not right. I, I, I think that, that if that becomes the, the thing, I mean, I think it's like, I think we, I'm optimistic that people are, I'm also, I'm optimistic about human health being the driver. I don't think that people are going to wake up one day and be like, oh my God, I just been thinking about all the pigs in the farrowing crates and I just can't do it again. You know, I don't think that that's how, cause it's been, it's been 20 years that people have known about the pigs in the farrowing crates and yeah. the chickens that are de-beaked and the downer cows. It's like, it's just all bad news, but we still keep plowing ahead and doing the bad stuff, right? Making the bad decisions every day at the grocery store, right? So, or we opt out and become a vegan. Right, but there's I, no nuance. So I think if if the news about the treatment of animals isn't enough, but I, I am banking on people being concerned about their health and sort of saying, looking at the system being like, you know, if this is a system that makes chicken grow five times as fast as normal, cows grow about twice as fast as normal, pigs grow about twice as fast as normal and um i'm healthy and want to stay healthy and don't want like abnormal crazy tumors to grow in my body like spontaneous growth is bad and obesity is bad i want to opt out of the system because of the connection between animal health and human health you know i just think as somebody as a as a person who's just aware of the amount of dna we share with these animals the fact that they're on this uh, obesity fast ramp and they're super diseased like effectively a strong inflammatory response. We have all these inflammatory diet issues in our in our own culture now. I would just think from a wellness perspective and a health perspective, people should be opting in to to animals being treated well in support of their own wellness. Hmm. So I I I'm kind of I'm banking more on the connections that are being drawn by people on the leading edge, yourself included, that are just like you know what, I think it's it's probably not great to eat animals that have had that particular growth trajectory, right? And we don't know all the reasons why. We get little glimpses, right? We talk about omega-3s. We talk about, you know, heavy metals and things. We talk about things like woody breast and chicken, which is this very, very fast-growing chicken that the, the, the proteins grow so quickly that it almost tastes, people think that they have a piece of wood in their mouth, right? Hmm. That's from very fast-growing protein. So these things sort of blip up on the news and I would think that the connection with the human wellness and animal wellness, it's so obvious and so clear and such an easy, actionable step that I, I'm optimistic about that. I'm optimistic about people choosing to opt out of a system where animals are deliberately unwell yep. um, in the interest. And I think self-interest is amazing. You know, I think it's what, what makes the world spin around. So let's, let's say, uh, encourage people to, to, to support their own wellness with animal wellness. What about composting? I think that's like an interesting, as far as carbon emissions and all that stuff. And I believe dumps being having plastic bags filled with all of your compost and whatnot going in the trash can and then just sitting there and, and brewing and fermenting and doing whatever it does. Isn't that a big problem? Wow, I don't know about that. I don't know if compost is a big Maybe source. I just made that up. I feel like there could be like a new kombucha in the future. I that's think like that's a, a thing. I think if you, like, if you like wave the little wands over <laughs> those, you like fly a little helicopter. I think like, uh, I'm pretty sure that's a thing. Well, Landfills you know, like are a big issue. It's funny too. Does composting matter, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> I'm thinking like, what can we do if I'm not a farmer? I know. Okay. So what can, I mean, there you got to, absolutely. Well, there's the other thing too. It's like, you know, the biggest source of, um, you know, a carbon usage in, in your life as a food consumer is your refrigerator. Hmm. Literally, like, keeping cold food cold right. is, is more of it. So there's, like, if you want to, I actually, I, I had a dream of doing that a couple of years ago, and I didn't do it, but I'd like to live for a year or two without a fridge, right? Yeah, if we're going to go radical, that's probably where I'd start. Get in a van. Enjoy, right? Exactly. Van life. <laughs> Hashtag van life. I, I wasn't going there. Gonna, I was just going to... <laughs> Good. Regenerative van life. It's a movement. But you know, I think you you gotta look at the the. There's no such thing as a casual good choice in America with food. There's no there's no like just just phone it in and it's gonna be cool. Just trust the system, hmm. right? So you have to wake up to that, right? That any any decision you have to not pay attention is a decision to support 
something that's probably bad for the environment and bad for animals. Mm, but good for the bottom line of somebody else. So if you're just saying, oh, whatever, I'm just in the airport, I'm just going to buy the chicken Caesar. No, nah, that's why I'd say big flashing red light. Or like, oh, yeah, there's a supermarket that says natural on the awning. It's probably all good in here, right? So when you don't engage in the information, you don't, I learned, I've learned that the hard way, you know, just being in the industry that if, if I'm not really paying attention, I learned this when I took all the, all the crap out of our restaurants. You know, we didn't have a lot of crap in our restaurants. We have s- six restaurants now. And we were, you know, I just said, you know what? I, I don't, I want to make sure we get rid of all the canola oil and all the seed oils. Like, right. let's just scrape it out. And, and, and everybody on the team's like, you know, we don't have very much right now, but we'll go through. And we went through every marinade. We went through every, every item. And then I said, great, let's just buy in avocado oil. Well, gosh, it's like, you can't buy enough avocado oil for a six restaurant chain. Hmm. Like it was, we, it was like a two month delay, you know? So I learned the hard way that when you try to do the minimal kind of like better for you steps and put them into place in any scale, the whole system is stacked towards hyper-processed seed oils being yeah. everywhere. And, and, and also when we took out all the, we looked through all our marinades and everything we bought that was prepackaged, we ended up just taking away everything prepackaged because everything had sugar and had GMOs and had stabilizers and had seed oil. That's like the magic cocktail of all pre-made ingredients in America. So it just like, I learned in doing that how hard it was. And it was just really clear to me, like there's no such thing as an, as a sort of, well, I'll trust that this one's going to be okay. You know, if you're not like actively informed at the point of purchase that this is something different by the fact that it probably costs more. Yeah. Has the name of a farm of it was like, is weirdly packaged. It's probably not a great choice, you know? And that's a, that's a really hard thing to say, um, you know, given how, you know, how many people I think are trying to do an amazing job in the American food system, you know, but I, I do believe it. It's like if you're going to be a consumer that's concerned about the environment and making positive choices, you actively have to uh, make choices that directly support producers that are doing the right thing. Yeah. It seems like if you are a person, we will wrap up kind of kind of soon so we can finish off this all yeah, of our things yeah go after it but it seems like if, if you're a person that has the bandwidth to do some research and ask some questions because there's so many people that truly don't have that bandwidth mm-hmm. I, would, I would imagine mm-hmm. in, in in the world um it's like a real opportunity to be like a like a fucking revolutionary mm-hmm. you know like you like you are like you are the difference like, like if you're in that position where you do have the extra a little bit extra resources or a little bit extra time mm-hmm. um i can't think of too many other things that would be more rewarding than mm-hmm. than going deeper into to questions like that and i think too if you know there's a lot of people that are i mean the majority of americans don't have the privilege of spending a lot of time or money on this kind of thing but i'd no. say start with your milk hmm. and your meat um and your fats Right. And then go from there. But look, look to, you know, be you, if you can't address it all at once, address it by category. Hmm. Right. And make a and inform yourself by category about what the difference is, um, because you got to start somewhere and it's overwhelming as well. Right. The other really key thing, I think, is the power of cooking. Yeah. And from an economic perspective, that's one thing that's brought me a lot of joy in COVID is just like seeing people cook. I mean, cooking is the ultimate act of rebellion against the agro-industrial system, hmm. right? You're making your own food. You, know, you don't need to thaw it. You don't need to have somebody else package it and process it and deal with it. And then all of a sudden, if you start cooking from scratch, you don't have to be worried about a million different things, right? Because nobody needs to put xanthan gum into a whole chicken for you. And you're saving money. Nobody needs to put corn syrup into steak, right? None of that needs to happen, right? So there are some really key things that you just take charge of with your health when you start to cook. Another key thing I think is, from a health perspective, be super cautious about sauces. I'm amazed by the crap that people put into sauces, the amount of stabilizers, the amount of sugar, um, this whole focus on like hyper palatability. So I'd say as a consumer interested in health and wellness, I don't even care kind of start with whatever protein you want, but evaluate what's in that salad dressing, what's in that meat sauce, what's in that dip. All those prefabricated things, there's some really great things you can learn to make at home, like a chimichurri sauce, right? Uh, simple, like chopping up a lemon rind with some olive oil and some, uh, you know, flat leaf parsley and a little bit of salt. It's a bomb sauce. Super yep. delicious, right? You can put some, you know, sugar in, coconut aminos or something to make a sweet and sour wine. I'm not saying no sugar at any cost, but if you go into the sauce world, you're going to see that it's not actually sugar. It's typically, you know, corn syrup and things. Right. So 
taking charge of those little things and like just kind of clearing out all the jars in your pantry, right? I firmly believe in, in our restaurants we've done it and it's been expensive for us to do, but like I'm, I deeply suspect any food that can just hang out for a while and not go bad, yep. right? So focus on things like if you've got lurkers in the back of your fridge, I don't want to eat stuff that's a year old, that can be a year old. And it's like, well, it's still fine. It's a year old. That makes me even more worried than it being a year old, the fact that it's fine and it's a year old, yeah. right? Food should be on a journey. It should be decaying. It should be alive, right? So let's be cautious about that with our health, right? So think proactively about everything that goes with the food that you make and start to make those kind of incremental changes. And you'll find you're going to, you know, save money, right? Um, you're going to have healthier food, you're going to have, uh, you know, the ability then to spend more of your money on the center of the plate if you kind of cut out some of the extraneous stuff that we see as, as highly necessary, but actually is just a, a way a lot of highly processed food to get into our diets. Mm. That's perfect. My final thing, which is a whole nother Pandora's box, okay. but you don't need to go overly deep into it. I'm curious your perception of owning a restaurant or six restaurants during coronavirus how's your experience with this been what do you what is the what does the future have in store for for restaurant owners how are you still existing right now so our business is actually up in coronavirus right so we're really weird in that one and now i've shut three restaurants i had nine before Hmm. so i've had to shut three that were in malls effectively um and weren't weren't going to ever work now, but the restaurants that have kept open are doing better. And I think it's because there is an attention to health right now. And our restaurants are very clearly about people who want to spend a little more and have really clean food. Yep. So I think that's part of why we're succeeding. And then we also are pretty good on having food that's like, it's not very fancy. So it travels well. You know, you're not, you don't really come to Bill Campbell for an amazing, you know, glamorous dining experience. You come for clean food, pretty simply presented and it does well. So we've been able to grow in this time. And, um, and then also we've had our own supply chain. So I think that, you know, the supply chain, the fact that the meat industry was so hurt by coronavirus and there was these massive outbreaks in plants that were poorly managed and these meat plants were shown to have just like pretty egregious disregard for the health of their employees. That's all been stuff that is helpful for consumers to know about, right? But I think the future of restaurants is really challenged. You know, the reason that restaurants don't typically use really high quality ingredients is that they're really expensive and restaurants run on a really slim margin. Yep. The average restaurant in America had three weeks of cash on hand. So it's it's rough. And I think there's going to be big consolidation. I think more and more, I think that chains are going to make it through and everybody else isn't. You know, so I, I think it's a really rough, I this actually breaks my heart. You know, I, I feel that restaurants are this avenue to entrepreneurship for a lot of new immigrants, for a lot of people, you know, looking, it's like a first business for many people. And it's just, it's going to be cratered for a long time. I don't really, you know, in our business, we're doing okay. Um, But we've also, you know, it's been, it's been a total roller coaster and it's been highly stressful. And I think, you know, I'm not saying like, yeah, we're going to make it through either, even though we're doing well so far. Right. So I think it's going to be a big, I don't know if the, if the, um, what's going to come out of it is going to be improvement, um, over what it was before. I think some people are saying, well, it's going to, you know, force all these trends that were already happening. I'm not seeing that yet. I see a lot of small businesses that were a great source of like independent, reliable income for families and communities are, are not going to make it through. How have you emotionally been navigating the whole last four months or three months, whatever it is now? I've been been doing a lot more time outside. Okay. You know, I've been doing a lot of like I do a meditation in my on my yard on the grass or I visualize roots underneath me every day that anchor me. Hmm. So I actually have been thinking I focus a lot on imagining I mean I can't control what's happening and it's terribly turbulent I had to fire you know over 200 employees in the first week of this right and then I've got two little kids who are at home you know everybody has the kids that are home right now so it's not like anything to talk about but it's just like I'm dealing with everything that everybody's dealing with and then also caring so much about my team and then also being terrified that I'm asking people on my team to work in an environment where they're terrified for their health Hmm. right like this is awful you know it's an awful circumstance and There are people who are afraid to go to work because they're immune compromised. And I've had people, you know, just everything has happened, right? Um, But so my personal practice, though, has been to, I really focus on imagining like a, you know, a tree or a plant with deep, deep roots that can take a a hurricane 
and might come out like a little damaged, but it's fundamentally still standing. You know, like sort of imagine the buffets of the winds and the and the the ocean crashing over you and how deep roots help you thrive. So I think about our firm and our operation as like a metaphor for survival and resilience. And so I've been really just thinking about that it's a it's a replica of the system we're building on the farming side is a resilient, durable, thriving system. And I think about that for my own body and my own wellness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so in, I'm so impressed by you oh thanks wow <laughs> not that my opinion matters but the whole time I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm like she's gangster nice let's eat <laughs> some liver now <laughs> where should people go from go from here I wanted people what, what can people do as far as like they, they go to Bell Camp and you guys do deliveries they, yeah. how do they so if you're local in farms? LA or the do? Bay um, you can um, go on to we have an app you can download and get delivery of all of our foods and our fresh meats our eggs and everything else. And then we deliver nationwide. Um, and it's actually free shipping of over a hundred bucks. So um, you can stock up and get it ship free. It, it's delivered um, within one or two days. And that's on bellcampo.com. Cool. And they can visit Mount Shasta. Yeah. So we actually, we do education events. I host them pretty much all summer long, but not now, obviously, but we are renting. Um, if you go to hip camp, hip camp the you know like the awesome camping website mm-hmm. we rent for like 100 bucks a night you can stay on the farm and we have a farm store you can get some meat and camp out they're really it's not just a campsite though it's like a beautiful like a platform tent with um two comfortable double beds in it and uh, showers like warm showers and it's a really nice setup so if you want to see a regenerative farm in action it's got all the livestock of course but then we also have an orchard and organic farm and that kind of stuff as well so it's unbelievable it's It's really great well i think for right now too in covid it's such a dope location because you could drive there from la it's a long day it's like eight ten hours um from the bay it's about four hours but you get up there on a friday stay through monday um there's plenty of rivers if you're into cold water there's beautiful just really healing water and then the energy of mount shasta is amazing it's supposed so, to be a, a chakra of earth it is it's a it's super high vibration Do you know what chakra is supposed to be i don't know which one it is i don't know i think it's i don't know which one but that's like a thing it's pretty spectacular it's like a spiritual center you can just stare at that mountain for a long time it's a good one it's amazing. all right um well thank you so much for everything i really i like i'm so deeply in gratitude of everything that you're doing for for me personally and for my friends and for the world and for your community and for your employees and for like you're great thank you i appreciate it thank you thank you all so much for tuning into that conversation my dear friend anya if there was any specific tidbits that you found extra helpful uh, por favor, share those out. Instagram is a great place. You can tag me at a line podcast or Anya Fernald or both of us. Uh, you can also tag Bill Campo. Uh, highly recommend once again visiting Bill Campo. They also have an app, which is really great. So again, that in your app store, just look up Bill Campo and you can get the finest of food delivered to your home. Pretty amazing and uh, helpful for Earth as a whole. Helpful for the environment. It's just great. Uh, if you guys have interest in learning some breath practices that will help create energy in your body. You can literally tune your nervous system through the manner in which you breathe. And that's exactly what we break down in the Align Method online program. And you get some free breath practices by going to alignpodcast.com. Really great stuff. Uh, We are super proud of it. I am super proud of it. It's been a project over the last several years. And uh, we have, we're at a point now where um, I think it's amazing. People are loving it. So I appreciate you guys jumping on there and checking that out over at linepodcast.com. Thanks for supporting the book. Thanks for using iTunes. Thanks for doing you. We got a conversation coming up next week with, uh, I think it's going to be next week. I, I recorded it today. And uh, or yesterday in Santa Cruz uh, with Bruce Lipton, who was one of the major inspirations in my life. I wrote the book Biology of Belief. So tune in for that. Super excited about it. And uh, once again, appreciate you guys tuning in. Alrighty, it's past my bedtime. Over now. I'll see you next week. <laughs>